Thank you very much indeed. So, the reproductive biology of pterosaurs. Until very recently, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Is it switched off? Yes. Do you hear me now? Shout if I'm awfully sorry. I'll stand here. Until very recently, we knew nothing about the reproductive biology of pterosaurs. Thanks to a whole series of finds over the last 10 or 12 years, some of which you see here, consisting of eggs with embryos, and in one case associated with a parent, we now know quite a lot about the reproductive biology of pterosaurs. When we look at our fossil record of the reproductive biology, what we have here is various growth stages, starting with eggs and embryos, hatchlings and early juveniles, and we go on to adults. So that's the kind of grown up or growing up bit of the spectrum. This is the bit that we're interested in today, and I've given a few examples here. You can see that we don't only have embryos, but we have hatchlings as well. And this is very important because we can deduce a lot from this kind of material. So, what sort of questions can we answer about pterosaur reproductive biology? We can talk about how many ovaries they had, we can talk about the kind of investment that parents made in their eggs, we can talk about the nature of the eggshell and what that tells us about the nesting environment, we can talk about whether they were super super precocial, super precocial or artificial, and we can talk about their growth rates. And these five aspects really allow us to characterise in quite a detailed way what was going on with pterosaur reproductive biology. And to save you the uh, cliffhanger at the end, what we can tell you based on the answers to these, which I'm going to go over in a second, is that pterosaurs reproduce in a way which is very, very different from that of the two extant flying groups, birds and bats. So, first one's first, one over or two, this is a really easy one. Here is an example of Darwinopterus from the early Jurassic, uh, what's it called, Jiaoji Shan formation of Liaoning province in China. The fantastic thing about this fossil, which we call Mrs. T, she's a female. Here's an egg preserved in association, and here's a detailed view of that. When we first described this, because we suffered from extremely poor eyesight, we didn't notice that, in fact, there is a second egg. Here is a counter slab of Mrs. T, which was described last year by Wang et al. And what we see in the counter slab sorry, is the remains of a second egg, which is a bit more clear here. Uh, so we definitely had two eggs developing in this individual. So we think it's very likely that Dominopterus had two ovaries. And in the reproductive uh, uh, processes are very conservative as a rule, it's likely that this is true of most of them. Pterosaurs. The size of the egg can tell us a lot about the investment that the parent, notably the mother, is making into the reproductive process. And this is very well understood in living animals, as you'll see in a minute. Unfortunately, we have Mrs. T with her egg, so we can get some insights into what's going on with pterosaurs. It's a very straightforward task ish to reconstruct the likely mass of the egg for Mrs. T, which comes out at around about six grams. Actually, calculating the mass of Mrs. T is slightly harder because there are light estimates. Here's a rather old light estimate. There are heavy estimates from the remarkable Dr. Whitten, uh, that's a little while ago now. Um, what we can do, though, is to essentially aggregate together all the estimates and come up with a sort of likely uh, uh, mass for Mrs. T. Um, and when we do that, we can then plot her and her egg on this diagram, which shows initial, oh, I'm terribly sorry, which shows initial egg mass here, so that's the mass of the egg when it's laid, and down here is the female mass, so that's how much the mass is of the female who laid the egg. We have lots and lots of data for birds in blue, lizards in pink, well, sorry, spray mates, uh, turtles in green, crocs in this sort of nice browny colour, and what we can do, and I've done already here, sorry, I jumped the gun slightly, here's Mrs. T, and the reason there are little ticks on here is that shows us the kind of 
um, potential range in values that we get. But because this is a log log graph, that range isn't going to be very big. So that we're fairly confident that she's in there somewhere. We can do a very similar thing with Teradostro, comes out here, and we can actually do it with one other pterosaur, which is um, the Ornithocyde Hamitrus. I'm sorry, I haven't put that one on here. But Hamitrus, interestingly, falls out over here as well. So, conclusion is, pterosaurs lay relatively small eggs, like extant reptiles, and probably like, I'm sorry, I won't do that again, and probably like basal amniotes. And indeed, the trend that we see, insofar as you can produce a trend based on three points, yes, of course you can, this is paleontology, the trend that we see mimics that of extant reptiles rather than, for example, uh, birds, where it's much steeper. Birds, of course, lay relatively large eggs, especially the kingry, which lays an absolutely enormous egg. Eggshell incubation. The, I could talk about for hours about the eggshell and what it means for incubation, but I won't. I'm going to do this very quickly. Here's an egg from the Cretaceous of China with a beautiful little embryo preserved inside it. No calcite at all associated with this eggshell, or indeed with almost any of the other eggs that we know of, pterosaurs. I'll come back to the one that we do. And what you see very nicely in this one is some very nice folds, or some of the ripple marks here, which show that that shell was relatively flexible, foldable, bendy, stretchy, however you want to have it. Now, just in case you're thinking, well, it's a flat fossil, you know, who knows? Okay, here are the eggshells for a pterosaur called Hemipterus, also from the lower Cretaceous of Xinjiang province, I think it is in China. And here we see the beautifully preserved eggshell, uh, which shows very neatly how flexible those shells were. Pterodostro, you're saying, there's an egg of pterodostro, and it's got a bit of calcite associated with it here, but here we go. It's, a, it's got little plaques. It's ever so thick, it's about 30 microns thick. You see some SEM pictures of it here. This is from Chiappi et al's paper, which is now 12 years old. God, where does the time go? Um, so we see a little bit of calcite in one or two cases. That's not a problem. If we go and look at shell types, or egg-producing amniotes, what we find is over here, birds, crocs, turtles with their rigid shells and quite a thick layer of calcite made of various uh, structures. Pterosaurs very much on this side. Most pterosaurs have a lizard like This does not mean to say they're related to lizards. <sighs> it just means that they have a shell that looks like lizard shell. And maybe pterodostro is kind of analogous to what's going on here in the pliable shell. But pterosaurs have relatively pliable or parchment-like shells. That tells us two very important things about the nesting environment. One, it's hard to sit on a relatively pliable or extensible shell because it will go out of shape and the embryo inside will start going, for God's sake, get off! Um, <laughs> but you can, you can do it. However, there's another problem, which is that with these kinds of shell types, there's a risk of the shell, sorry, the egg drying out very quickly. So, it's extremely likely that, as do nearly all those groups with pliable or parchment-like shells, that the eggs are buried in some way, shape or form in vegetation, <coughs> soil, sand, whatever it might be, in an environment with relatively high humidity, so they don't dry out, because if they do dry out, the shell, oops, sorry, the egg will die. So again, we have a kind of reproductive strategy in terms of the nest, whatever you want to define as a nest, as something which is fairly typical for basal amniotes. They don't incubate their eggs with that kind of contact incubation that happens in birds, as far as we can tell. Pterosaurs, were they super precocial or altricial? I'm going to go over this one quite quickly because all of those of you who go to SCPCA will have seen my talk from two years ago, and the few of you who stayed awake till the end will remember that they were super precocial. Here's a typical skeleton of a neonatal pterodospo. This is an animal that's just hatched out. It's exactly the same size as the embryo from the egg that we have of pterodospo. And if we compare that in a very simplistic fashion with, for example, a neonatal uh, 
stained skeleton and soft tissues of a starling, Sternus vulgaris. You'll see there's very little ossification in these things, apart from in the skull and in odd bits of the limb bones, and in complete contrast to the pterosaur. But if you go and get a button quail and uh, kill one of those and have a look at what the degree of ossification is, you'll see that these extremely precocial birds are actually very well ossified. Not the ends of the bones, because they've still got to grow, obviously, but a lot of the limb bone shafts, vertebrae, bits of the skull are all well ossified. So the degree of ossification on its own is very typical of super highly precocial birds, not the pterosaurs of birds, of course. If we look at the proportions of the bones here, in, with regard to each other, we do simple or complex morphometrics. We find that these neonatal individuals almost always compare very well with adult individuals. So these neonatal forms are essentially tiny versions of the adults. What we also see in this beautiful specimen of the small pterodactylus, when we put it under a UV light, or should I say, when we get a Helmut Tischlinger and make him put it under a UV light and take a photograph, is some beautifully preserved membranes shown in black here. And they are identical in terms of their distribution and their relationships to the skeleton as those of fully grown up, ostologically mature, and quite clearly flight capable adult individuals of the same pterosaur, Pterodactylus coccyx. Here's a pterosaur which goes under the name of Ning Chung Opterus Louis, and its real name, of course, is Fei Longus, and it comes from the uh, Lower Cretaceous of China. This is a very small individual, not much bigger than that tiny little Pterodactylus coccyx you just saw. The reason you're looking at this is that there's some beautifully preserved soft tissue in this specimen of the wing membranes. If we look in a bit more detail, here's the wing finger down here, here's some wing membrane, and what we see inside those wing membranes are structures that are absolutely typical of the wing membranes of adult fully flying pterosaurs. So not only do these neonatal pterosaurs, very near neonatal pterosaurs, have wing shape and distribution, membrane uh, shape and distribution, that's like that of adults, but the structure inside of it is the same as that of adults. Finally, if we take an embryo, which is probably very near hatching, and we reconstruct it, this is work done by Matt Wilkinson at Cambridge, you can very easily work out the likely wing area and estimate the mass of these things and do some very simple statistic aerodynamic analysis comparing wing loading, which is merely the area of the wing membranes in total compared to the mass of the animal, and the size measure here, well, we used wingspan. Nearly all these are typical um, ostologically mature individuals, except that, uh, well, in this case, it's an embryo, but it's very near being neonatal. This individual clearly has uh, basic aerodynamic parameters that are the same as those of the dogs. So, if it wished to, it certainly could fly. Whether they actually flew or not, we don't know, but there's taphonomic evidence that suggests that they did, which we don't have time to go into. If we were to take a hatchling bird or a hatchling bat and put that on here, the point would fall out, and you see my marker point here? Keep following up, keep following up. It's going to come out somewhere up there, because their wings are very small, so their wing loading is very high. They can fly. You just have to make them go really, really fast. So fast they probably burn up in the atmosphere. <laughs> Worth doing, I feel. So, if we summarise what we know about the super precociality or not of pterosaurs, here's degree of ossification, morphometrics, uh, wing membranes, aerodynamic abilities, and preservation. We've got a whole series of pterosaurs where we've got perinatal individuals, and they score pretty well for all that. Um, it looks very much like pterosaurs were super precocial. So they were certainly able to locomote very soon after they hatched out, certainly within hours or days, and they could probably fly as well. And that super precociality is also something that is typical, as you well know, of squamates, crocodiles, turtles. These are all extremely precocial individuals who can look after themselves practically from the moment when they were born. Sometimes they do get parental support, but not very much. One minute. Oh, oh, oh. Growth rates in 30 seconds. Right. Rampharicus has a beautiful growth series. Uh, 
Adina Pompey and colleagues did a beautiful study of this, published in PLOS One a couple of years ago, where they pulled out a lot of data on the histology, and what they showed was that many examples of Rampharynchus actually have lags inside them. You can do a very tricky and probably quite dodgy thing where you nest these all together to actually produce a cross-section, which is a composite, and we can work out how old the animal was at various sizes, and based on mass estimates, we can look at how many grams a day they were putting on, and we get some very low figures, less than a gram a day. If we put this onto a graph which shows the growth rate in grams a day against body mass, which is the best way of doing this, you'll see that birds grow relatively quickly, extant reptiles grow relatively slowly. Guess what? Rampharynchus falls on there, Pterodostro falls on there, we've even got Montage Darko on there as well. So all the pterosaurs where we can do some very speculative growth rates, they all fall out at growing at things like a gram a day. I'm nearly done. I'm going to do my summary. <laughs> so we've got paired ovaries, we've got a relatively low parental investment, we've got a partial pliable eggshell, we've got incubation by burial, Simple precociality, probably little parental care, and comparatively low reptilian growth rate. These are all things that basal amniotes do. So we have a type of vertebrate that has advanced flight capabilities, and nobody disagrees that as far as I'm aware, but at the same time has a reproductive mode, which is just like that of basal amniotes. Contrast that with modern birds and bats, which also have an advanced flight capability but have reproductive modes that are also highly evolved. What's going on there? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>